Good morning, everyone. Um, today we will be doing um, the National Worlds Week, and we will be discussing test state in test state succession, how to draft the will and where to find assistance. Most importantly, the masters will also be discussing with us the Guardians Fund and how to access it. We know that we have been, it has been almost two years in relation to lockdown. And many of us have lost um, friends, families, and it's very important that you that uh, a will be drafted to ensure that you know what are you going to leave behind for your um, loved ones. In addition to that, when it doesn't, one of some of the challenges that you do have is that if you do not have a will, the the challenges is on your beneficiaries and. Uh, one of the things that can happen is that the the property, if you had property, property can be be uh, sold at the end of the day if it was not allocated. And if there was maybe a child or a young person that was still in the home, the challenge is that the child might sit without the home. So it's very, very important. There are many lawyers um, that will be able to assist you between the, the, the week of the 13th to the 15th of um, September this week, and that they will be able to give free worlds, pro bono worlds, and will be able to support you. You need to go on the Law Society's um, website and find a lawyer in your area. I just want to welcome everyone. I want to welcome Sawad. Um, I want to welcome the Law Society of South Africa, the Master's Office and Department of Justice, Legal Aid South Africa, and also South African women lawyers who are, have all made this um, uh, um, make the, made this happen today. So I'm going to hand over now to Renee Carstens, who is from Legal Aid South Africa, and she will be telling us what is the difference between testate and intestate succession, and what happens if you die testate, which is with the will, or without the will, which is intestate. Um, Renee is from Legal Aid South Africa, and she is a civil principal legal practitioner at the Cape Town local office of Legal Aid um, South Africa. She's got a BPROC um, from the University of Pretoria as a admitted attorney. She's an admitted conveyancer since 2000. I always get excited, you know, when I see women just having all of these um, degrees. It's quite, you know, transformation of our profession remains a challenge. She has extensive experience in civil litigation, and in particularly family law, and she heads the civil unit, which comprises obviously estates, civil litigation, and labor. She also heads a cluster within the Western Cape Northern um, Cape Province, and in this role, she provides advice and guidance to other local officers in dealing with complex, complex matters. Um, she's also responsible for the legal candidate, legal practitioners program at Legal Aid, and also for the newly admitted attorneys. So welcome again, Rene. I know that we do this every year. And thank you again for being a partner. Thank you again for Legal Aid for being here. And I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Siam. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I was asked this morning to, to speak to you regarding the state and interstate succession. And one of the most important things that a person needs to think about is death and how their assets will be distributed after their death. When a person dies, um, their assets will be distributed to in terms of either their will, um, which is testate succession, or according to the rules of interstate succession, if the person dies um, and has not left a will. So a will is a written document in which a person called the testator voluntarily stipulates how his or her estate will be distributed after his or her death. Now, someone is going to speak about wills after my session, um, but just the, the shortly the requirements for drafting a will is that the testator must be over the age of 16. He or she must be a person of sound mind. In other words, he must be mentally capable to um, draft a will, and also it must be done personally. So South African law allows for the freedom of testation, which means that where a person uh, or deceased has attested to a will and last testament, setting out how his or her estate must be uh, devolved, um, 
they, they, they must be given effect to that after his demise. A person can also nominate in the will um, someone that will administer the estate that is called an executor. So if a valid will is found, the executor must carry out the deceased instructions as closely as possible while still fulfilling past obligations such as unpaid debts and anti-natural contracts. In such a scenario, in order of, of inheritance will normally be determined by the deceased. So a deceased estate consists of liabilities, that is all the debts and all the assets. So that can be properties, money in bank accounts, uh, vehicles, household furniture, and so on. If the deceased was married in community of property, the surviving spouse must receive his or her half share of the joint estate first. If the deceased was married out of community of property, but with the accrual system, the surviving spouse might have a claim against the deceased estate for an accrual share. Only once the debts have been paid off and the surviving spouse has received his or her share in terms of the marriage in community of property, or um, if there's an accrual, uh, then only can you dispose of the half share of, of the joint estate. Um, if the deceased was married in community of property, the joint estate is frozen upon the demise of the one spouse. This situation often creates hardship for the surviving spouses, especially where the bank accounts were all in the name of the joint estate or in the name of the deceased. As no person may withdraw funds from the deceased bank account or deal with any of the estate assets until someone is appointed by the master to act as executor in that estate. Unfortunately, the reporting and finalization of a deceased estate in South Africa can be a lengthy and complex process during which most of the time, all of the assets will be under the supervision and control of the master's representative, which is then the executor or a master's representative when the estate is below 250,000. So what happens when a person dies without leaving a valid will? When a person dies without leaving a will, that person is referred to as having died interstate. This means that the deceased assets and properties will be distributed in terms of the Interstate Succession Act, that is Act 81 of 1987. Interstate succession will determine the heirs to a deceased estate in the following circumstances, when the deceased failed to attest to a valid last will and testament, or where it is impossible to carry out the wishes of the deceased because of the beneficiaries. For example, they have predeceased the testator or they do not wish to inherit. A person can die completely interstate or only partly interstate. The latter would be where, for example, a testator is um, specifically bequeaths one portion of his estate in a valid last will and testament, but omits to deal with the rest of his or her assets. In this instance, the portion that has been bequeathed by will shall devolve testate as set out therein, while the rest of the estate will devolve according to the rules of interstate succession. Where spouses were married in community of property, the estate will first be divided in half. The surviving spouse will receive half by virtue of the marriage in community of property, and the other half will devolve in terms of the Interstate Succession Act. Now, in terms of the Interstate Succession Law, only certain people, um, which are called beneficiaries, can inherit from the deceased estate. These beneficiaries are the deceased legal spouse, the, his children, blood relatives and adopted children. Now there are certain rules and procedures for inheriting interstate. So the first one is when the deceased has left a spouse and children, what happens in this instance? The spouse and biological children will all inherit, but we will first have to um, calculate the child's share. Now what is a child's share? When a spouse dies and is survived by a surviving spouse and children, a child's share must be calculated. To calculate this, you divide the value of the estate by the number of children of the deceased plus one for the surviving spouse. The law says that a spouse must receive 250,000 or a child share, whichever is the higher amount. The second scenario is when only a spouse survives the deceased. Now, when such a spouse do not have children and one of the spouses dies, the surviving spouse will inherit the entire estate. The deceased parents, brothers and sisters will inherit nothing. The third scenario is when only the children survive the deceased. In this instance, 
the children will inherit the entire estate and share it equally. When the deceased dies without a spouse or, or children, um, that is, so if the deceased parents are still alive, each one will inherit half of the estate. If only one parent is alive, the dead parent's um, children or grandchildren will inherit in place of that parent. Only if the parent does not have children or grandchildren will the other parent inherit the entire estate. Where there are no parents, the deceased estate will be inherited by his siblings equally. If one of them has passed away leaving children, the children will inherit the share of the deceased sibling. The last scenario is when the deceased does not have a spouse, children, parents, or siblings. Then we are gonna have to look at the closest blood relative of the deceased and they will inherit. Close in terms of blood relation means, for example, uncles, aunts, cousins, and so on. It does not mean close in terms of who was living close to deceased or who was in close re personal relationship with the deceased. A further note about the interstate succession is that an illegitimate child has a right to inherit from his or her father. And an adopted child can inherit from his in adoptive parents and their blood relatives, but can only inherit from the natural parents or their blood relatives if it is, the child is so named in terms of a will. So one can see that it, it can get quite complex if, if there's no will and, and the interstate succession must apply. And it leads to a lot of um, acrimony between family members who feel that they should inherit or where promises are made by the deceased before death um, to a child or a, um, a, a parent. And it, can, and it can cause a lot of problems. So that is why it is so important for a person to have a will and, and to have that freedom to say exactly who must inherit and must benefit from the estate. According to the prevailing South African case law, persons married in terms of Muslim rights should be regarded as spouses for purposes of interstate succession or are entitled to inherit from their deceased partner in terms of the Interstate Succession Act despite the fact that, that their marriage is not recognized as a valid marriage in terms of our current law. So the cases that, that was decided on this was in 2004 and in 2008, and the court recognized that a wife to a monogamous Muslim marriage um, is a spouse as, as for, for the purpose of interstate succession, as well as the maintenance of Surviving Spouses Act. And then the second case in 2008 dealt with the, the polygamous Muslim marriages. And the court found no justification for excluding the widows of polygamous Muslim marriages from the provision of the Maintenance and the Surviving Spouses Act, as well as the Interstate Succession Act. The court held that the continued exclusion of widows of polygamous Muslim marriages from the benefits of the act would be unfairly discriminatory against them and be in conflict with the provisions of section nine of the constitution. Marriages in terms of Muslim rights are generally regarded as being out of community of property, which causes a lot of hardship for those women that is left behind. So if a Muslim passes on without having left a valid will and testaments, the provisions of the Interstate Succession Act would find application and not Islamic law. Neither the surviving spouse, descendants, nor ascendants can compel the implementation of succession in terms of the Islamic law. It is also important to note that if you die without a will, any surviving unmarried partner will not receive the same benefits as those who are legally married. In other words, the law of succession will prioritize blood relatives over such a partner and they would not be entitled to any part of the deceased estate. So in conclusion, if we have a look, what is the law of succession in South Africa? The law of succession refers to the rules and regulations surrounding the devolution of a deceased individual estate. It governs certain actions, such as how outstanding debts are paid, how contractual obligations are upheld, and how the remaining assets are inherited. The most influential factor in these proceedings is whether or not the deceased individual produced a valid will. If a valid will exists, an executor is appointed to oversee the proceedings, settle the debts and ensure that the wishes of the deceased are carried out as closely as possible. It, 
If no such will exist, an executor is appointed to settle the debts and ensure that the remaining assets are transferred to correct the relative as stipulated in the Interstate Succession Act. The Act further provides the order in which the relatives are prioritized for inheritance if no will is found, um, like we have dealt with before. If no blood relative can be found, the estate will be placed within the Guardian's Fund for up to 30 years, after which it will be forfeited to the state. Executors are usually chosen by the family of the deceased, or various professional executors can be appointed to fulfill this role. Even if a child or spouse is not included in a person's will, it, they may be able to make a maintenance claim, um, which must be settled before the estate is inherited. So um, the maintenance claim of a minor child will take preference before any other claim against the estate or before any beneficiary may inherit. So if someone is excluded or a minor child is excluded, that is not the end of the road for them. They can still have a maintenance claim, which will take preference. Children born out of wedlock are also able to make such a maintenance claim. Um, and if no will exists, are entitled to an inheritance in the same way as a, as a legitimate child. This is also important to note because we find in, in our work and in the administration of estates that the family does not always recognize those children and um, want to exclude them from inheriting from the father or um, estate. Um, so it is important um, to also be aware that there is a maintenance claim, even though you are excluded, maybe in terms of a will, but you are also included in terms of the Interstate Succession Act. So when we divide an estate amongst the surviving spouse and children, a child share is determined. Now, we've done, gone through this, but just in, in conclusion, a child share is calculated by dividing the assets of the estate by the number of children plus the number of spouses. So each spouse will then receive either 250,000 or a child's share, whichever amount is bigger. The remainder of the estate will then be divided amongst the children. Now, I hope that this was informative and, and that everyone can see how important it is to have a will. Um, it, it just leaves the family in such a predicament when there is no will when, when a person dies. Um, like I said, we deal with estates where in minor children are involved um, and are the beneficiaries. And it is extremely difficult um, because the family will always think that they are entitled because they are family. Um, like I said, that there might have been promises before the deceased passed away, um, which they feel should be honored. And that is unfortunately not the case. If it's not in a will and it, if that's been um, attested to, then those um, wishes of the deceased cannot be adhered to. It is only when there's a will that we can administer that estate according to the wishes of the deceased. Um, if not, we have to unfortunately follow the interstate succession. And like you can see is that parents will be excluded and many parents are uh, de um, dependent on their children for the, for the um, maintenance and care. And if they are not included in a will, they will unfortunately be excluded if they are minor children or a spouse. It is also important that, and I, I've mentioned that specifically, that if you are not married, you will not have a claim in terms of the interstate succession. So the only time that you can benefit from the will is if you are married or, um, or if you are included in the deceased will and specifically named as a beneficiary. I think there's a lot of people also that stays together and believe that they will be looked after when the deceased passed. And that is unfortunately not the case. So from my side, that is uh, the interstate and test state succession. Uh, thank you, Siham, for, my, um, for allowing me to speak on your webinar today. Um, I hope that it was informative and that it will contribute to people um, during this World's Week. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Um, there are a few questions in the chat already, um, but what we will do during question and answers, which will be at the end, let's all let's get all the um, speakers um, to give their presentations, and then thereafter we will go through the questions. I'm going to um, hand over now to Eunice uh, Masipa, um, who is the director 
of a Pretoria law firm, which is Masipa Attorneys. She's the member of the Law Society of South Africa. Um, and she has also acted as the president of the Law Society while, um, you know, uh, whilst the president was acting as a judge. Um, and so welcome. I know that Eunice has got lots of other hats, um, which she has not indicated to us, but I'm going to hand over to you so that you can inform our, our um, uh, listeners and viewers on how to draft the world. Um, thank you, Eunice. And it's lovely to see you again. Thank you so much, Siham. It is great to see you again after the longest time. And good morning to everyone. Um, firstly, before discussing the requirements of a valid will, we must bear in mind that only someone who is 16 years or older and who is capable of appreciating the nature and effect of their act at the time of making a will is competent to enter into a valid will. And this is in terms of section four of the Wills Act. Now, how to draft a will. Before you start the process of drafting a will, you would need to know what would constitute a valid will. The act prescribes um, a, a number of necessary formalities that need to be complied with. Um, firstly, we all know that a will it is a written document and it needs to include the following information. The details of the testator, which should be their full names and identity number, a detailed list of your assets, how you wish your assets to be distributed to your beneficiaries, names and identity numbers of your beneficiaries. Identity numbers are very important because more often than not in families, we've got people who share the same names. So we need to note the identity numbers of the beneficiaries as well. Your will must be signed and dated by at least two individuals, both of whom must be over the ages of 14 years. And this must be done in the presence of the testator. And one other important um, fact to note is that um, if a person is a witness to a will, they cannot be named as a beneficiary, as an executor, administrator, or guardian. And if they are nominated as such, the nomination may be void. Um, now, we also find instances where a testator is illiterate, is illiterate and unable to write. So if the testator is not able to sign and they sign the will by making a mark, um, either by a cross or a thumbprint, this has to be done in the presence of a commissioner of oaths. The commissioner has to satisfy themselves, has to satisfy themselves to the identity of the testator. And if the testator does not sign by making of a mark um, or a thumbprint and their will is signed, um, uh, by someone on their behalf, same has to be done in the presence of the Commission of Oath. The Commissioner will then have to sign every page except the last page where they are going to certify. Now also we need to note various other points which are fair practices when you know executing a will that all your pages should be numbered and witnesses should sign or, in, or initial every page of the will. The will should be clear and readable, whether it's uh, typed or handwritten. Signatures of the testator and witnesses must be as close to the last line as possible of the will on every page. And the will has to be dated. And this is to avoid confusion in the event that another will is found. Um, and now when we come to naming beneficiaries, you know, it may be a choice as to who you want to name as beneficiary in your will, but there may be other legal requirements, you know, that may, you know, force you to name other people as beneficiaries in your will, such as maintenance agreements or marriage in community of property. So if you don't name these people um, in a will, your will may be contestant, um, you know, and also if you are responsible for a spouse, a parent or child, they should also be named in the will, failing which your will 
um, runs the risk of being contested. Now, when you are bequeathing your assets in your will, you can try to make it as easy as possible, for example, by saying that you leave all your assets um, and your personal positions to a beneficiary and name the beneficiary and the identity number. But however, it is advisable to be as specific as possible and not just make it easy. So when I say as specific as possible, you can, for example, include all the details of your assets. Um, you can say such as this property or investment account, savings account number held at this particular bank. So you must use the correct description and names of those assets um, or account numbers that you wish to bequeath to your beneficiaries. You can also include details of your outstanding debts, loans, or any other credit cards, and also details, how, details on how you wish for those liabilities to be settled upon your passing. Um, and also exactly, you know, instructions to executor and on how to split your to split your assets among your beneficiaries in the event that there is more than one beneficiary. This process makes it easy for the executor to know what your assets are and what you intend for what you, what your intention is for them and to follow your wishes as per your will. We spoke about an executor. Now, naming an executor and who is an executor. The executor is the person who will be responsible to ensure that your will is followed and that your assets are distributed to your nominated beneficiaries. Now, who can you name as an executor? It can be your attorney, financial advisor, a trusted friend, or a bank. And also note that if you are named as an executor, you, you cannot be named as a beneficiary, excuse me, in a will. And should you be named as a beneficiary in the will, it is advisable that a co-executor is also appointed to assist you, to assist you in the process of um, distributing of the estate. Um, one other thing, um, if your estate is below the value of 250,000 rands, you do not have to appoint an executor. The master of the high court will, represent, will appoint a representative, which can be a family member nominated by um, beneficiaries to act um, to, to distribute your assets. So you would not need to nominate, to nominate an executor. And um, you know, one, one other question that people like to ask is, can I draft my own will? Well, it is possible to draft your own will without help, but it is advisable, um, you know, only if your financial affairs are straightforward and you don't have children who are under age or you don't have children or people with special needs whom you are taking care of. But it is always advisable that you appoint an attorney or a professional to assist you with drafting of a will, because then they are able to anticipate any issues that may arise in the event that your will is contested or, you know, in the event that there are any issues that arise when you do pass. So like, you know, if you do have, you know, extensive property and investments, you know, and a lot of things, you would definitely need to appoint a professional who will assist you in, in the drafting of a will. Now, where do you get an attorney during Rules Week to assist you with drafting of a will? You can simply go to the Law Society's website at www.lssa.org.za and then a list of attorneys will appear. You go to your specific province, specific town, and you can locate an attorney who is closer to you. And you also have the advantage to request that attorney, if you do speak the same language, to draft that will in a language of your choice, a language which your beneficiaries and those who you leave behind will be able to understand. So, you know, it is very important that we have our wills in order. You know, this also indicates that we do care for our loved ones. Um, it will cut time, it will cut stress and um, avoid any disputes should 
that may arise in the event of our passing. Thank you. Was I, was I? Yeah, thank you, Eunice. Yeah, you can put on. Thank you so much for that. There's a lot of questions and I'm glad that you actually indicated uh, where they can find information um, on the LSSA because there was a question that they tried to um, um, access lawyers. So on the website of the Law Society, you need to go to World's Day and that there are different lawyers in different provinces that have all indicated that they will do pro bono services. Um, please check again and it is on their website. I'm going to now we are going to speak about the Guardians Fund um, and it is I'm quite privileged to invite Advocate Vuyani Lali, who joined the department way back in 2004 as assistant master. He has all the master environment experience and is the deputy master for the office of the High Court in the Western Cape. Currently, he's also acting head of, head of office for the master of the High Court in Kumalanga. And Advocate Lali is very passionate about community outreach, which the Office of the Master renders, especially those services targeting the most vulnerable, which are children and women, um, members of the public, and also experience in terms of the Guardians Fund. Welcome again. It is great to see you uh, again, um, Advocate Lali. And I'm going to hand over you to you um, to speak about the Guardians Fund. You on mute? You on mute? Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mai, the facilitator, and let me greet each and every one of you. Let me thank you for the opportunity and especially the Department of Justice for making this possible. The Guardians Fund, as we will all know, the Guardians Fund administers funds in respect of minor children minor children and also people who are incapable of managing their affairs, monies in respect of known and unknown persons, monies in respect of creditors. These monies are kept in the guardians fund, but they are classified in different accounts. When monies are deposited into a guardians fund, we open an account for each and every beneficiary. These accounts are interest bearing account, non-interest bearing account and commission accounts. Let me speak specifically about the interest bearing account. Interest bearing accounts refers to monies in respect of minor children and people who are incapable of managing their affairs. Normally we term them as being patients. When this money is in the guardians fund, it accrues interest. Interest have been declining over the years, depending on how the rent is performing. Currently we're at 4.5, the interest rate that is generated at the guardians fund. And furthermore, monies also that are non-interest bearing accounts. It's monies that we receive, for instance, where we cannot locate somebody or where the, the monies are, are, are invested in respect of a deceased estate know that it could be invested in it for minors in respect of a deceased estate where there is a will, which has been mentioned, where it will stay that monies must go into a guardians fund and in an interest bearing account. Also with regards to monies for patients, where the road accident fund will deposit monies into the guardians fund, but we will only accept those funds if there's an order of court instructing us to accept the monies into the guardians fund. Commission, <clears throat> it's monies that are deposited when they are creditors. Creditors may result out of insolvency matters. For instance, where a person who worked for a certain company is not found, they will deposit that money into the guardians fund. But on top of that, there is a 5% commission that is debited from those monies. And also 
it is also important to, to state that the Gardens Fund, we have six offices across the country. I will name the offices. It's Pretoria, Masters of the High Court, Peter Marisberg, Master of the High Court, Grahamstown, Master of the High Court, Bloemfontein, Master of the High Court, Kimberley, Master of the High Court, and of course, Cape Town, Master of the High Court. All those offices assist in respect of these monies of the minors and patients that we administer. One, as we know that in terms of our country, we've got a vast country. So these offices are available in six provinces, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone, for instance, if you are in Cape Town, you are staying in Mossel Bay, it doesn't necessarily mean that you must come to the Gardens Fund in Cape Town. As we know that each and every magistrate court is a service point of the master of the high court. So we have made those means to say that since we know that people must be able to be served at their own places where they are residing, which means that we are bringing services closer to the people. Our magistrate offices, there is a section that will deal with and assist with the guidance fund where forms are available. They assist in completing those forms and then they are sent to the relevant offices. For instance, I'll make an example with the Nell Spate, where I'm currently based. People come in, we don't say no, go to Pretoria because the gardens fund where disbursements are made are in Pretoria. We don't say go to Pretoria, we will assess, we will take all the applications and forward them to Pretoria. The type of application that we use in the gardens fund, it's a J341 and a J251. A J341 is where the minor is staying with the, with the mother or with the guardian, where there will be periodic payments in respect of that minor. We pay for school fees, we pay for clothing, we pay for medical and anything. We can even purchase properties in that respect, provided there is sufficient money in respect of the minor. If there's a property that is purchased, it shall be registered. We insist that it must be registered in the name of the minor child. When we pay for school fees, <clears throat> we need, excuse me, we need proof that indeed this child is indeed at school. So the school will provide us with the banking details and a letter confirming the grade that the child is in. And we pay directly to the school in respect of the child, even whenever it's medical for medical purposes. With regards to <clears throat> properties, we deal with attorneys where there must be an undertaking that the property shall be registered in the name of the minor. And even with the, we can even purchase a vehicle, but provided that the beneficiary, which is a minor, does have a driver's license. So the guidance fund is very important in respect of uh, the minor children, in the sense that the minors are available at any request whenever you want them. But for compliance purposes, there must be an application. As you know that the Gardens Fund has been audited and is being audited. And for the past eight years, we have been receiving a clean audit, which means that the monies that are deposited into the Gardens Fund are safe. And nowhere will monies go missing. And for also with regards to where do we receive these monies? The monies come from estates. The monies are from GEPF, which is our major client. And these monies are also from insolvency matters. So it is always impossible that, possible that whenever monies are needed, you lodge your claim and application, and then we will pay out. Our offices pay in different phases, but I wouldn't want to go in, in detail with that. But with regards to our turnaround time in respect of payments, it is 40 working days. 40 working days, which means that it excludes public holidays and weekends. But our offices always try to do their best in terms of paying before that 40 days time comes into being. And also I'm happy to announce that uh, the chief master 
has also said that we must make attempts in opening a master uh, guidance fund at the NELF state office. So I'm sure that even the inhabitants, the residents of Mpumalanga will be happy with that innovation. But it's not going to be this year, but it's a matter that is in progress. We are still working on it. In terms of the guidance fund, we have legal people who deal with legal matters, who would look at wills, who will look at the accounts, and we are also privileged to have financial people who work on our finances on a day-to-day -day basis. So the guidance fund is an important aspect in respect of the administration of the estate, because if there's no guidance fund, it means that those monies will be paid into trust accounts of attorneys. And I'm not just saying that attorneys are wrong in terms of how they will deal with those monies, but it's also, it's always safer to have the monies into the guidance fund. And also when the child is 18, I had made mention of a J251. When the child is 18 years old, it's then that they can come and claim their funds. But if the will states that the monies must be paid at a certain age, maybe at 21 or 25, then it means the only amount that we will be paying out when the child has reached the age of majority will be the interest that has been received. The capital and interest, if there is any, will be paid when the child reaches the age of 21 or 25. But normally with GEPF money, those monies are deposited and the child can claim them at the age of 18. Another factor that is worrying to us as the department and also guidance fund management is the fact that there is a competition that we normally find ourselves with, which we call uh, tracing agents. It is important to state clearly that the guardians fund administers this man monies in respect of minors free of charge. We don't charge a cent. There's nothing that we charge in respect of administration. Now, the challenges that I had mentioned that we normally get is that a child will come to our office, make an application and say that normally the question that we would ask, how did you know that you got money? They will say that, no, somebody approached me and told me that there's money in the guidance fund. And if I sign this uh, form, I will be giving that person 25% of the money and then the guidance fund will pay out. We, are, we normally interview the, the clients who come to us because we don't want a situation where monies go to a tracing agent. And it has happened in the past, where monies, the agent will put in the banking details of the minor because we verify the child and see that indeed this is the person that you are supposed to be paying. Only to find that the child comes back maybe after three months to come and inquire to us, my monies have been, been paid out. And we will say that, but no, in terms of the account that you brought to us, and everything that is on our file, we paid out the money. So we would really, really insist that guardians must always be vigilant when it comes to tracing agents, because these monies get lost at the end of the day. And with the guardians fund, we are always certain that we want to do the best that we can in terms of protecting and paying these funds in respect of the minor children. I'm not sure if uh, I still can go on because I can go on until it's a passionate subject of mine. I can go on until at night, Mr. Mai. I'm not sure if I could hold on now and wait for questions or I should continue with the presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Advocate Lali. What we're going to do is that there's a few questions that has come out in Rene um, uh, uh, around uh, wills. Um, and I think it's something which, which has already been addressed, um, which is around who's competent to make a will and why should you do a will. Um, if there are any questions from the participants, uh, what we will do is that we will now open up the um, question and answer 
for any um, challenges that any of the participants might have. Um, they can put it in the question and answer or they can raise their hand and uh, request and, and see whether or not it's any challenges. Um, I also wanted to ask just Rene, um, just going back again, um, who can assist you with making a will and can you do your own will? Must a person go to a lawyer to be able to make a will? Rene? Sorry, Siam, do you want me to answer or do you yeah, want yeah. to? <laughs> I don't know if Eunice, Eunice, to you or Rene? Well, um, I think it's, at, yeah, okay, let, let Eunice answer. Okay, um, thank you, Renee. Um, well, like I mentioned in my presentation, um, you may attempt to draft your own will, but then you would need to familiarize yourself with the, with the requirements that will validate your will because there are specific requirements that have to be met. So you may attempt to draft your own will. However, it is advisable to have a qualified professional to assist you in the drafting of a will. It may be your financial advisor, your attorney, um, your attorney or your bank. And this is to avoid your will being challenged in the event that there are any issues identified after your passing. So you may attempt, but it is not advisable. Um, there's one question for Rene, which is, where do we get all this detailed information on administration of deceased estates to read later? Can it, um, yeah. Is there a place where they will be able to go to be to to get more information around tested and intested succession? Hi, Siam. Thank you. Um, I I must be honest. I I googled yesterday um just to supplement my notes that I have um from training that I've received. So there is quite a lot on the internet as well. Um, if people want to have a look at that, um, I. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I think on, on Legal Aid SA's um, website, we also have self-help um, portal that, that has a lot of information on various topics, so people can have a look there as well. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of information out there if people just um, play around on the internet or, um, yeah, but that, that is what I, I suggest that people start by. Thank you, Rene. Um, just another, another question. If a party did an entire will um, and there is some changes that need to be effected, must they do an, a, a will completely over or um, is there maybe an issue that they can set um, to, to um, the, the, the will? Well, I think I think it's better to just revoke the previous will in totality, just to avoid any confusion. But you can also do an addendum to the um, if it's it's just something that you wish us to add to the the will, you can do an addendum and have it signed again um, in the presence of witnesses. But it is better to just avoid any um, uncertainty later to revoke the previous will and just draft a new one, wherein you include your your wishes then at that point in time. Um, thank you. There is another question, and I think it will most probably go to Mr. Lally. The immediate freezing of funds when someone dies sometimes make it very difficult to pay out uh, the funeral expenses in particular. Funeral policies don't always cover all the costs. Is there a way of ring fencing an amount to be accessed by a designated family member for funeral expenses by the master? Does the master allow for funeral expenses before um, the, the estate have been administered? Um, are you on mute, Mr. Uh, Advocate Lali? Sorry. Thank you for the question. Will that be from the funds of the minor or where would the funds be from? Because I'm not clear with the question because it's practically impossible for us to assist with the funeral 
with the with the funds of the miner that are deposited into the guardians fund. Maybe I'm not sure whether it's from an estate or it's monies that are deposited into the guardians fund that a funeral must be done with. But in those circumstances, we are very, very strict with regards to paying such an amount. Because you must know that in terms of funerals, some families will prefer a funeral with high cost, then it means therefore those monies that are taken will deplete the funds of the mine. Bear in mind that we are always cautious in paying out of the capital. It's always better for us when we pay out of interest that has been generated in the guidance fund. So I, I would want the question again, maybe it, if it could be rephrased, whether is it with, re, with payment with regards to monies of the miners that are in the gardens fund. If there are sufficient funds, if there's much interest that has been accrued, we normally do assist. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I can I just come in there. Um, unfortunately, um, once the deceased passed and the funds in his account are frozen and there is a funeral policy, it's important um, to make sure also that that policy is, um, there's a nominee or, um, that will receive the funds um, in order for the funeral to be paid immediately. Otherwise that policy will pay to the estate, which causes a, a lot more um, problems for the family. But if it's the policy does not cover the whole of the, um, the funeral cost, unfortunately, um, there's nothing that the executor can do at that point because he hasn't been appointed and doesn't have control over the assets of the deceased at that point in time. But any person that then assists the family to pay the funeral cost um, may, may claim from the estate later. So they can put a claim in for the funeral cost paid by them. Um, on behalf of the beneficiaries. So um, there is a claim that can be submitted, but not be, not uh, immediately, unfortunately. Thank you, Rene. There's some uh, more questions uh, for the master. Uh, where specifically is the master of office in, the, uh, in Johannesburg? Can I direct a complaint to the master about the tardiness of an executor? So if an executor does not liquidate the account or they take years to be able to to um to to finalize the the estate what can a person do anyone mr La um, advocate lali well okay with regards to that matter because anyone has got a right of reporting any matter to the master's office where you feel that the executor is not doing what is supposed to be doing. Once that matter has been reported to the master, we will look into it to investigate and see if really there are discrepancies that the, the executor has done in respect of the estate. But in total, the, any person who's aggrieved by the executor, it should be known that the executor is not appointed by the master. The executor is appointed by a person who has reported the estate at the master's office. And the master's office duty is to oversee the administration of the estate. Once the matter has been reported to us, we know that we must give the party, the executor, his side of the story. The Audi Alter and Patem rule will apply so that he can tell us as to what is it that is outstanding or why is the matter not being finalized at all? Then after that, we will make it that if we see that there are discrepancies, definitely we will have to appoint another executor, an independent executor. But with that, we would be informing the, the parties. Definitely in terms of how and when do you finish winding up an estate, it always depends on the complexity of the estate. It's not a question of that it will be done in two months time, because if an estate is huge and it's complicated, then it means that it will be done in, maybe we are saying in terms of the act, it must be wound up within a year, but normally that is not the case. And it should be borne in mind that 
there are two types of estates we, that we deal with at the master's office. Estates that are over 250,000 where letters of executorship are issued. And estates that are below 250,000, we normally issue letters of authority. So hence I'm saying it would be a bit of a catch 21 situation where I can say that it can be done within six months or whatever, but it always depends on the complexity of the estate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Advocate Lali. There are still a few questions. Um, what happens, and this is for all the panelists, what happens to the assets and cash unclaimed if someone died without a will? I see. Um, thank you. If I may, um, I, I also saw this question and I think I've dealt with it in my presentation okay. as well. So if it's unclaimed and there's no will, the monies or, um, well, all the assets will be uh, liquidated and the monies will be paid to the guardian's fund. It will stay. You, um, priest, you, uh, we can't hear you, Rene. Um, Rene, you were just muted, but um, can you just oh, repeat that? Sorry. Okay. Um, I said that um, all the assets of the deceased will then be liquidated and the money will be paid to the guardian's fund. If no one claims that money within a period of 30 years, it will be forfeited to the state. Thank you. Um, if I'm married and my husband has children before marriage and I do the will that excludes the, um, adding mine only, will the 50-50 still apply when I'm no longer there? That is obviously if you married in community of property. Okay. Um, obviously, um, like I said, that you can only um, bequeath your 50% share in the joint estate. So if you're married in community of property and um, uh, the, the one spouse died, the other spouse will get the 50% of that joint estate first, and then only will it be divided between beneficiaries either in terms of a will or in, in terms of the interstate. If it's interstate, um, the children of your husband will obviously also have a right to claim against his 50%. Um, and, and if you die, uh, I think the question is if, if you are not late, so that the wife is no longer there and he has children, um, they will be able to not to claim from your 50%, but definitely from your husband's 50%. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Maybe the, the person can raise a hand or just um, put another question on. Uh, thank you. Um, there's another question, and this is relating to domestic partnerships or live-in partners. If you have been in a live-in partner with a person and that person passes away in testate and there's a child, do you have any claim to the estate if you have proof? Secondly, if there's a family of a former married wife with adult children, do you have a claim? Okay. That is very complicated. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's start with the unmarried person. So it doesn't matter how long you have lived together with, with the deceased at the time that it passes. Um, you will not have a claim in terms of interstate because you are not married. So the children will take preference. If you have a child with a deceased and he has um, children from a previous relationship or marriage, those children will also be included. So the, the children of the deceased will inherit. Um, if you can prove that you were dependent on the deceased, you might have a claim in terms of the, um, the Maintenance Act but you will not be entitled to share in, in the estate otherwise. Thank you, Rene. There is currently a case which is um, case which is before the Constitutional Court that actually relates to domestic partnerships. And however, if you are um, living together in a same-sex partnership, then you will be able to, and your, your partner died in this state, you will be able to claim from the estate, from the estate um, in terms of the maintenance of surviving spouses um, uh, um, act. So, so there are provisions that have already been made, but that is only in same-sex partnerships. 
However, in domestic partnerships where the, it's heterosexual couples, the law has not yet changed. And um, we are currently waiting on the Constitutional Court to make a finding on a, 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 a Buania case to be able to, to see whether or not the law has changed in relation to that. And I think that is very important because domestic partnerships and religious marriages is still not recognized in South Africa, which makes, which is quite challenging. And Rena has spoken earlier about Muslim marriages and how you register um, your estate. Another question, there's another question around, um, uh, maybe Eunice will be able to answer, but it's got to do with the commission of the lawyer in relation to the estate. Maybe you can explain. Um, and then also in addition to that, um, whether or not you must pay security to the master for performing your duties, because sometimes people can't afford to be able to do that. Can that be excluded um, uh, from, from uh, uh, in your will? So there's two questions, the issue around security and the issue around what is the percentage which the executor can take or the lawyer, et cetera, from the estate. Okay, um, thank you, Siham. I'll just address the issue on um, um, the percentage that the attorney is entitled to. Um, they, you know, we can't refer to it as commission. It is the executor fee, and that is in the event that the attorney is appointed as an executor of the estate. And the fee is 3.5% 3 of the total value of the estate. So there is no um, commission that um, an attorney will get when they draft your will. Um, it is only that um, that executor's fee that is prescribed at 3.5%. So any other fee that is paid outside of the will's week would be uh, a fee for the services of drafting, an drafting a will should you utilize the services of an attorney. And I think Advocate Vuyani may address um, the issue regarding um, security. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Munith. Just a final question around, um, sorry. Oh, Vuyani, do you want to answer? Question with regards to security. Yes. That must be, that must be lodged. The security. Yeah, yeah it, it is always important that there must be security. There must be a bond of security that is lodged by an executor. Bear in mind that in most instances, not that it, it doesn't happen, but it does happen, where maybe there is some maladministration that has been done in respect of an estate, then it's always easy for the master's office to call up that security, that bond of security, in order for us to save the assets of the estate. Because it will be equivalent, for instance, if the value of the estate is about 3 million, we would need security to that value so that it must cover the estate. Because once we don't get a bond of security, normally this will arise in estates where there's a liquidation and distribution account. With section 18.3, estates that are below 250,000, we don't normally too strict on it. But if it's not the wife of the, of the deceased, we will request for security. Bear in mind that security will also be mentioned in the will. It's the discretion of the testator who or testatrix who will say that there must be security. The executor must not be requested to, to furnish security. So if it is mentioned on the will that then we normally dispense with calling for security. But in most instances, we are forced to call for security to safeguard the interest of the estate and the assets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one a question again, what do you do in the event where you are told that you are a beneficiary of your aunt's property? However, maybe you haven't seen the will and the individual is, who is in possession of the letter of authority is not telling you that you are a beneficiary.
Are we Sorry, is it um, can you maybe just repeat the question for me? I think it's just a, why, what do you do when somebody tells you that you're in a will of your aunt's property and you can get however the individual who is the executor is not telling you that you are a beneficiary? Um, well, you you will have a right to see the um, the will, of course, um, if you are if you know that you're supposed to be the beneficiary, um, and if for some reason you're not included, but the deceased has informed you that you will be the beneficiary to the the the, the property, and somehow it has changed, you can contest the will and you can inform the master that you are um, disputing the the validity of the will. Um, but the executor is supposed to, and in, in you know, in terms of his role and in terms of his um, uh, what he is, is required to do is to inform all beneficiaries that they are um, to inherit. So I'm not I'm not sure if you know that you're in a will, but the executor is not telling you. I'm not quite sure what the question specifically wants us to answer. Okay, thank you. Um, this uh, just. Sorry, just to add on what uh, Ms. Custom had said, with regards to files at the master's office, one can have access to a file and go and check if there is indeed a will that has been left. But that is done on request at, at the premises at each and every master's office. So it is a document that can be obtainable. Not necessarily you will get it, but you are able to peruse it when you are at the premises of the master's office to see if indeed this property has been left to you in terms of the will. Thank you. Thank you. Just one, uh, uh, the, another final question. What is the difference between a master's representative and an executor? And can I, second question, can I be assisted to understand um, oh yeah, to claim for funeral for funeral expenses, does it require a LOA or LOE? I think it must be a LOE. Does it require a letter of executorship? So what's the difference between a master's representative and a um, executor? Okay. Um, if I may, um, I know Mr. Lali is, is more capable than me, but I will take this one. Um, a letter of executive is issued where the estate, the value of the estate is more than 250,000. Um, a master's representative is appointed in what we call a section 18.3 estate where the value of the, the estate is less than 250,000. So with a letter of, uh, of a master's representative and a section 18.3, um, the requirements are less because of the value. So there's no um, liquidation and distribution account that needs to be done. As soon as the master's representative has the um, letter of authority, he can proceed to, um, to distribute the assets um, if, if it's a will or um, in terms of the interstate um, and see that all the debts and everything is paid. So a letter of executorship is for your bigger estates. There the executor will have to um, advertise the estate. He will have to um, submit a liquidation distribution account to the, the master's office. So the requirements, is a little bit um, more for when it's it's a bigger estate. And then the second part of the question, if I've got it correct, is if you want to claim funeral uh, expenses, you don't need to have a letter of executorship. Um, uh, okay, I, I think the question is that if there's a policy, I think if I assume th there's a policy and you need to claim that from um, the, the from the insurance company and there's no nominee um, or beneficiary nominated in terms of the policy, then you will have to have a, well, depend on, on the value of the total estate, a letter of executorship or letter of authority. So you cannot claim that money on behalf of the estate unless you have that appointment. So I hope that answers the question. But if it's, it's, if it's that if you need to, to claim against the estate for funeral costs paid, you will have to wait until a, a master's representative or executor has been appointed and submit your claim against the estate. Um, thank you. Thank you, Renee. Um, does the will, I think we've discussed this and I think, 
Rene, I'm sorry for this, but there's another question around, does the will cancel the 50-50 of in community of property? Um, if my partner's got children before his marriage, then in addition to that, I don't know whether or not Eunice will be able to answer this, which is the rule of primogeniture and whether or not if a party in a customary marriage um, and your partner passes on um, and uh, the rule, the customary rule, obviously, is that the head of the family takes charge of the property. However, we know that there was the bear case. What is South Africans' current position around the rule of primogeniture in terms of customary law? That is for Eunice. And then Rene, again, this 50-50 in community of property and whether or not um, my partner's children will be able to get a share from my partner's uh, 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 property. Uh, Rene, do you want to, I don't know, Eunice, do you want to go? Okay, let me, let me start. Um, so the question is whether the will cancels the 50-50. Um, I think there's a, yeah, a bit of confusion. So if you are married in community of property and you leave a will, your spouse will automatically receive 50% of um, the estate, the value of the estate, because she's entitled there to, or he is entitled there to in terms of the marriage in community of property. So the, the balance of the 50 will then be um, distributed in terms of the terms and uh, of the will. Um, and then of course, if, if the spouse, the other spouse decides to exclude uh, children from a previous marriage, they will not be able to claim. But if it's interstate, then the, 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 the surviving spouse will receive a child share of that 50%, um, which is, uh, or 250, whichever is the greater, and the other the children, even before this marriage, will will also inherit. You cannot exclude them. So I hope that answers that question now. Thank you very much. I have a few hands that's up. I'm going to call on is it Kum Kumbula, uh, Masi Likishi, if you want to ask a question. Um, I see that your hand is up. Oh, no, sorry. I've been oh, sorted. Um, if I've I can sorted. have, yes. No, thank Welcome. you so much. Um, thank you so much. Um, I've been sorted out. There's somebody who asked a question that I wanted to know because I wanted to know if you want to, to do a will who must contact, but I, I've been asked. Well, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Nolutando Gwilialani has your, um, do you have a question? Hello. Yes. Yes, I wanted to know, I was dealing with people who are working for the mines. Now the mine, I, I wrote a question. The, the man, they do divide the money without going, going to master sometimes. Now there was this child who was born after the the estate was divided among the other beneficiaries. The mother was pregnant at that time. So the child didn't get anything, or it was the father who, who passed away. I want to know if, if, if can she get something? Yeah, thank you. Um uh I don't know is is if um advocate Lali or Renee Carstens want to answer, but um, if there are challenges, they will be able to also approach, as Rene has indicated, you know, the Legal Aid South Africa or even a pro bono attorney to be able to look in this matter. But um, Advocate Lali, I don't know if you want to answer. If there was money, I don't know whether or not it was in a policy, but the child got nothing. I do think it is because it's in a policy because policy pays out directly to the beneficiaries. Um, and it doesn't go through the master. Does somebody maybe want to explain that process? Hi, Shem, I'll, I'll explain that. 
So when there's a, um, it, I, I assume that it's it's a, a, a probably um, an insu a life insurance policy or that was held by the em employer, or it could be um, the pension fund as well. So when you are employed, your employer will or the your pension fund will ask you to nominate beneficiaries. Now that money does not pay to the, the state; it pays to the um, the beneficiaries directly. But the administrators of those funds or the insurance policies will make an investigation. So even if the 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 C said that I have three children, and another person can come and prove that that he or she also has a child with the deceased. Um, it's up to the administrators of that policy or pension fund to make a decision on whether on how they're going to pay out. They also do not have to pay out necessarily in terms of the allocation by the deceased. So if the deceased said everybody gets 25% if four children or divide it equally, they can say that, you know, there's a very young child and there, there's older children. So the younger child should get a little bit more because of the fact that um, that child will require more. So, but that is absolutely in in terms of that insurance policy or the fund, um, and the administrators make that decision. It is not up to the, the executor to, or they cannot in, um, involve themselves therein. So, if that child got nothing, um, it's either because the insurance or the the policy holder was not informed of that child, um, or that it couldn't be proven that the child wasn't that of the deceased. So that is the only thing. But that child, if, if it was proven that it was a deceased child, he should have gotten a share as well of that um, policy. Um, thank you. Um, there's another um, hand, which is, uh, yes, um, uh, Advocate Ali. Yeah, no, no, I think um, Ms. Customs has answered it properly because it should be noted that in most of these companies, they've got trustees is the trustees that determine where the money should go. For instance, if they say that money must come into the guardians fund, there are certain requirements that we need in order for them to deposit those funds into the guardians fund. So it's not up to the executor to request that if there's a child that has not yet been born, that the money must come to the guardians fund or it must go to whoever. It's the trustees that will do that and also it is always important that we especially civil servants that there is that form that is normally given to us by our hr where we must nominate our beneficiaries because it becomes problematic as we know that in terms of of the pensions funds act section 37c if there's no nominated beneficiary those funds will go to an estate will devolve in terms of an estate. Maybe that is a clarity that I wanted to, to, to also highlight, but Ms. Kastens has responded perfectly to the question. Thank you. Hello? Hello. Hello. You can ask Hello. your question. Yes. Yes. Hi, my name is Marvel. Um, I wanted to ask which one is better between um having your will done at the bank or by the law firm. Um, yeah, I'd like to know the advantages and the disadvantages. Uh, um, I'm not sure if I can answer or the experts in respect of wills will, but nevertheless, just my, maybe my colleagues will also come in and have an input. With regards to, it's your own preference, whether you want to make it with an attorney or with a bank, but bear in mind that in terms of when you make a will, it's you yourself who chooses who to be an executor. It's not a force that the bank must be the executor of your will, or even the attorney who's drafting the will must be the executor. It's up to you to choose who you want to be an executor. But it's always better that the executor must be a person, a professional person who will understand when 
it comes to the administration of an estate. Because bear in mind that if you have appointed, let's say your wife to be an executor and the value of the estate is above 250,000, it means that when you come to us, we will say that due to the complexity, even the amount that is involved, you must appoint an agent. An agent will normally be a trust company or an agent will normally be an attorney. And bear in mind that maybe let me say this unequivocally that every master's office is not permitted to inform you who to go to, to be nominated as an executor. Maybe let me repeat, we don't encourage it as the master's office that we as assistant masters, estate controllers or deputy masters, when somebody comes to our office and asks, who can I have as an executor? We don't do that because normally it will come back to you. When everything is going wrong, you will say that Mr. Lali had said that I must go to Ms. Samai because she was the best person who deals with estates. And if something goes wrong, then it means that I must be the one who's accounting. So we don't encourage that practice and we don't want it in our offices that staff members must choose executors or, or it will be as if you are uh, promoting one attorney over others. So it must be fortunately, Ms. Eunice had said that there is a list of attorneys that you can approach in each and every office. But in a nutshell, to come to your question, it is your choice. Whether you want it to be done at the bank, for me, I don't see any, any choices because if you do it at the bank, the bank is going to charge you for the drafting of the will and for the safekeeping of the will. Just like an attorney is going to charge you for the services that he or she has rendered. But for now, for this week, it would be better that you hurriedly go to each and any master's office because we are in conjunction with the legal aid and with our stakeholders, attorneys and trust companies assisting this to be done on a free of charge basis. Hence, we are having this week as our wills week. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you very much. I've got a final hand, which is Susanna. Um, if you want to uh, oppose your question. Hello, can, can I still ask something? Yes, did you ask a question? I just have another hand. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, Go ahead. Yes, um, you said this week, this week it's free for, for us to do wills. Yes. So like um, if I do it and then, and then it's a, a, law, a law, law firm um, and then I want to, 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 to adjust it like later, later on, like let's say in December, I want to adjust some things. Is that where I start paying? Or if I don't want to adjust it until next year or until when, whenever or, or when, 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 when the, the family needs to use uh, the attorney's services. Do I, are they gonna have to pay? Because now this week, this week is free. Are they now going to have to pay in the later stage? Or am I now going to have to pay in the later stage if I have to make um, adjustments? Yeah, can I just explain that World's Week is this week. <clears throat> Anything that happens afterwards, you will have to obviously pay the attorneys um, in relation to any changes that you want to effect to your um, to your will. Um, you don't. Uh, yes, it's own. It it it's good that you revoke your entire will. However, if it's just a small little issue that you want to may maybe make an adjustment, um, as indicated before, Rena has said and Eunice, that a codicil is a schedule. It's an annexure to an existing will, which is made to amend the will, and it must also comply with all the requirements of a will, which means in terms of the witnesses, in terms of the signing, it needs to be in writing, all those issues that was done, and then it can be attached. You don't have to do over your lawyers might just charge for that. But I mean, in terms of the cost, it won't be a lot. In addition to that, besides um, these also other institutions um, that does uh, uh, wills, but as 
uh, Mr. Lally, uh, Advocate Lally has indicated, they might charge you for holding or just for the executive fee. So that is why I'm encouraging people to go this week and ensure that that lawyer's draft uh, wills for free. Okay, so I can I uh, draft the will and then and keep it with me? Yes, yes. Uh, so let me just say where to keep a will. I think it's very important. And yes. this is the final um, uh, uh, question. Yes. Where yes, do I keep me. the will? Yes. We ensure that your original signed will is kept safe by a trustworthy person or an institution um, as a copy of a will is not a valid will. You can also have more than one signed copy of the original will and request different trustworthy people to hold it. Inform your family and heirs um, where to keep the copy uh, upon your day, uh, you know, so that they can access it so that they do not struggle to obtain it after your death. So it's very important that you put it away and that there are people that know where your will is. Um, I've got, yeah. Uh, Susan September, I see your hand is up. Susan September, do you have a question? Um, I don't know whether or not your mic is off or, or whether or not it's on mute. Patrick Molepo, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my, my, my question is pertaining to electronic mail if i am sick and i want to amend my will can i amend my will by electronic mail thank you yeah it needs to be in writing um and the requirements have not changed so um for example a video etc is not allowed we have not yet moved to the point of having worlds on uh, video, etc. It needs to be in writing, and that is the requirement. Um, I'm going to this another hand. Are there any other hands? No. Um, yes, this uh, uh, has been recorded. I'm going to now, um, it is half past 11. Um, a lot of questions have been answered. This information is all available on the Law Society, Legal Aid South Africa, as well as the Master's Office um, or Department of Justice's uh, a website. Uh, we hope that all the participants will make uh, their way and um, start drafting their world. If you have any questions, please take this week as an opportunity to go to the lawyers and to even ask those questions because that will also be done pro bono. Um, thank you everyone uh, for the webinar. If there are any other final questions, please just pop it in the chat. Uh, but Mr. Uh, Advocate Lally, uh, Rene Carstens. Uh, I just wanted to thank again Legal Aid South Africa, Eunice uh, from Law Society South Africa, but I think it will be a disservice if I say also thank you to the National Association of Democratic Lawyers, which Eunice is an executive member of. Um, most of these uh, uh, organizations are assisting with Free Worlds Week this week. And so we're encouraging people to attend. If there are any final remarks from all the speakers, um, Advocate Lally, from your Thank side. You. Yes, from my side, uh, I would like to state that throughout this week, the service desk at each and every master's office in each and every province, there is a master of the high court because there was a question, why were master's offices closed in other provinces? There are 
master's offices in each and every province in South Africa. And also each and every master's office this week has a service desk in respect of the Wheels Week. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rene Carstens, anything from your side? Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I, also, just from Legal Aid side, we are also involved um, during this week, and I think we're going to run it through to next week on appointment basis, as we are still working in teams in our offices. So we will basically assist over the two weeks um, coming this week and next week. Um, so people must please just phone our offices and make appointments. Um, then also, I just want to mention again, um, if you go to our website, which is www.legal-a.co.za, we have a self-help portal where you can also um, uh, download and print a, a simple will, which has we have provided there. And there's also a lot of information on administration of estates. It sets out also all the details of the master's offices, um, as well as the um, magistrate's court at where you can report. Um, so there's a, quite a lot of information on our website, which we can assist people in this regard as well. And then also just to confirm that um, we do assist where minors are beneficiaries in the state and um, people can approach us through the master's office and referrals um, to administer those estates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again to Legal Aid South Africa for always being available. Um, and then now we have Eunice uh, from your side. Any final words? Um, thank you, Siham. From the Law Society of South Africa, I just want to urge everyone to take um, opportunity of this great initiative. Um, let's get our affairs in order. Um, you know, go to the Law Society's website, get the attorney in your town, get your will drafted in a language of your choice if you are fortunate to get an attorney who speaks the same language as you. It is a great initiative. It ensures access to legal services for those who are fearful of approaching attorneys. So I urge everyone to go out and get our affairs in order. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. We do have a lot of other partners. I don't know whether or not some of our other partners want to just highlight some of the work that they are going to do in the next two to three weeks up until in, in December. Um, uh, we have uh, Sawad here. We have um, South African Women Lawyers. Uh, they are all part of us and also a Law Society, like I said, Law Society of South Africa. Um, and we will be continuing with these webinars um, as we move forward. Thank you once again to everyone. I wish you all the best. Um, uh, is it possible if I can ask all uh, the um, speakers as well as the stakeholders, a law society, et cetera, just to put on your, your mind, your um, videos? I just wanted to take a photo. Do you want to take a photo of that, sir? Um, Nomfunda, um, can you can you just uh... I say that I was very privileged because I was the only man in this. Uh... <laughs> yes, Mr. Lali. <laughs> <laughs> We miss you in Cape Town, eh? I am. Yes. <laughs> you must come back. You must come back from a goal. Thank you. What I'll do is that we'll just cut this and then we'll send it through to you. But once again, we'll do this again. Thank you for joining us. Uh, all the best for the rest of the week. <laughs>